Just stop it. The -the run-of-the-mill, cheesy, humdrum bullshit status quo just tires me out. What fascinates me are the industry disruptors, the superhuman frontiersmen or women who go through hell to achieve their goals. Join me as we meet and learn from those mavericks, rebels, and business leaders that aren't afraid to piss off the establishment in order to make radical change for good. Sponsored by Johto PR, the disruptive anti-PR firm that murders your competition with cinder blocks and cyanide. This is Disruption Interruption. Welcome back, everybody, to Disruption Interruption. I'm your host, KJ, and we're here today to talk to another industry leader that has steered off the lame, tired path of the status quo. Today's guest has been disrupting for over 15 years. She's a software engineer with a demonstrated history in healthcare and insurance industries. We're talking to her today because she's a strong protagonist and advocate for women in STEM, particularly engineering. Why is this important? Does it really matter? What is the status quo and what are the risks with the status quo? Coming to us live from Shakopee, Minnesota, please welcome our disruptor, Senior Engineering Manager at Canon Medical Informatics, Janelle Nelson. Hi, KJ. Thanks for having me on the show. Hi. Thanks for ha- thanks for being here. I love it when I get to interview women. Women disruptors. You know, there's a lot of women disruptors, but they don't always like to toot their own horn. So, you know, getting them on this show is sometimes a little bit difficult. I can definitely uh, resonate with that one as, you know, thinking about doing the show is that initial excitement. And then the, wait, I'm only a senior manager. Do I really (laughs) qualify to be on this show? But I think that is part of being the disruptor is really owning the achievements that you've had owning the cool stuff we all do cool stuff but how do you own that and how do you share that with others that's part of disruption in my mind so that's what was like really pushed me over the edge to want to come on here is like how do i really share what i'm doing and inspire others to you know follow their passions if i don't come out here and jump outside of my comfort zone you know i absolutely love that i have never had a guest talk about owning their disruption here. I think that has always been a tacit agreement with disruptors, but you're actually saying that and doing that. How does that tie into your main ingredient for disruption? What is your main ingredient for disruption? So being a woman in a STEM industry and engineering in particular is very challenging. There are not a whole lot of role models out there, especially when I was growing up. Like. This is not stuff you saw. The first leader I saw was until I was in college. So the first thing I think about is like, how do you disrupt this industry is being there, being present and owning the space that I'm in so that I can bring others up through that same journey without the struggles that I have had going into it. Again, I don't have female engineering leaders above me at my company. And really, I've only had that at one other company that I've worked at in my 20 year career. I've only had one female leader that was in the engineering side above me. So it is being there and kind of showing that it's possible and then reaching back into the community to be there and encourage more girls to be interested in being in STEM programming, wanting to be in engineering and showing them that career path is possible. You know, I find that to be really, really interesting, right? Because I hear this a lot um, and there are a lot of platitudes, I would say about women, you know, going into STEM. Um, I talk to my women clients about that, that are in, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. I talk to my uh, male clients about that. And, you know, one of the things that they say, despite uh, really working to get more women in STEM or girls in STEM is that there's right now there's not enough applicants. And then we look at the, I guess the ideology of meritocracy, right? And does it really matter if it's a man or a woman? I think it's super important to have people that you can relate to because rugged individualism will only take you so far right? Absolutely. Paint the picture from me, from your empirical observation, your own experience, the status quo of not enough women in STEM and engineering. 
So, you know, you can look at different figures, different research or, you know, whatnot. We're hovering maybe 22% are women within the engineering field. And what we're only looking at grad rates around 18%. So it's hard to grow and have applicants when there's just not that many females out there that have a background or have an interest. And it's interesting because you want more, you're advertising, you're trying to change your job descriptions to attract more, but there's just not that many out there and especially looking for jobs, getting them to switch jobs is maybe a little harder. And they drop out of the workforce or out of the engineering side of the workforce a lot easier because of the challenges that we have. When you're working with people that they all look like them, you know, a different, they look different, they think different than you do, you're constantly going up that, against that wall. You're constantly having to challenge and you're having to prove yourself to a higher level than they are to prove that you need to be there. And that's exhausting. Like to yeah. be there every day and to get noticed, you have to do that much more. So having people above you that look like you is important because then they're also helping you and have had that path before they can give you advice. But on the larger sense, if you don't have diversity within your teams, and that's not just females, but you know, people of color, LGBTQ like the whole spectrum, if you don't have diversity in thought patterns, let's just say we're only going to employ people that live in the Midwest, you only have a very small bubble of thought patterns that you're going from. And you can't be a global company if you're only focusing on how you see the world. You don't build products that help everybody. And in the medical industry where, you know, Canon Medical, we build the software that takes the images from your CT machine or your MRI machine, and we're putting that, you know, into the hands of your radiologists where they can get 3D modeling of what's happening inside your body. But if we're not thinking about what do all people look like, what are all body types look like, and we're only going to build it for what I look like, we're not helping our entire patient base. We're also not thinking about what is the experience of our users. The rad techs that use our software don't all look the same and they don't all think the same. They want different things. If I'm only drawing upon my experience, then I'm missing stuff. And that happens a lot in the tech industry. We build really cool software across the board. I don't know any company that an engineer comes in and says, I build crappy software. No, I want to be inspired. <laughs> I want to love what I do. That's part of the reason why you show up. But if we all think the same way, then we start having things, you know, the AI doesn't recognize everybody that could be using it. You know, the classic examples of, you know, it can't see facial features of somebody who's not white. That's a problem. That's why you need diversity. So the diversity of thought and women play into that because we really do look at the world differently. You know, how we were raised influences. So, yes, you have men that have empathy that can look at the world also differently. But in kind of that stereotypical general sense, you know, we come in with a different skill set, you know, stereotypical, some of those softer skills, helping to the communicate and build the bridges between the teams. If you don't have people in your company and in the industry that does that, you get very siloed. Uh, you get narrow thought patterns and that is a detriment to all of us. Yes, that is a detriment. And I'm glad you really related it down to the products that you build. Um, it reminds me of uh, someone else that I had on the show, um, really building new technology for clinical trials, right? And having diverse groups of people participate in clinical trials so that Absolutely. medications and drugs could be made for different body types. Not every body type, type is the same, right? Um, when you talk about the exhaustion, right? And you just touched on some of the different skill sets, right? I think mostly we're talking about soft skill sets, right? In terms of differences between women and men or right um yep. what is the part that you feel like or that you've seen that is a great asset 
as being a woman in STEM, right? But it's also something where those skill sets are typically overlooked, uh, not considered as important, um, just not understood maybe, that creates that exhaustion for you to have to push forward and like, I don't know, is it prove yourself or is it prove yourself to yourself or is it both? I think sometimes it's it's both. You come in and obviously if your company doesn't have a whole lot of diversity, your first thought is, was I the diversity hire? You know, are they only hiring me not because of my skill set, but are they hiring me because they need it gender diversity? On I'm the it. token so you're, woman. I'm, <laughs> I'm the token. token whatever, right? And yeah. it's really hard. So you're starting off with doubts within yourself when you're coming into a team where you're the only of anything. You start with those doubts. And then it, as you've got doubts, then you look at the people's actions of saying, they don't see a problem with what they're doing, but it's those microaggressions. It's the little things that they say or the you didn't get invited to lunch. So those are the things that start building up and help cause that exhaustion. When you're doubting yourself, everything feels harder. But it also comes with, as you said, like that soft skills as the assets that we have multitasking obviously you know like we're constantly here at home it's so like we got kids downstairs got laundry going you've got the dishes going in the dishwasher while you're working at the same time and of course maybe not all employers want to hear that this is happening but you know as i'm working if i would if i make the choice to work my evenings which is is a choice i make sometimes because i need it to do something else during the day I still have all that stuff going on. So we have this ability to multitask, which and what I have seen sometimes far out ex exceeds some of the peers that we have. But then as you're working within the teams, we're really bridge builders. Like I said, yes, anybody can be this, but with those soft skills, seeing that big picture, trying to connect the dots and, you know, get the teams talking to each other, reaching out, forming those connections between the teams is really important. And you can't do that if you're, you know, I like to say stereotypical software engineer who wants to sit and type on the computer. We need people that can talk, that can explain things, that can have that empathy for what somebody else is going through as opposed to the well i'm responsible for this piece of it so mm -hmm. i do this piece of it you know if you really step back and look at this the holeality it's not just one team that ever builds anything it's got connections to other teams to other products um, to other individuals and you have to really build that together and in the medical industry you know if you look at the sales side of it all of this you, you sell based upon connections you know you don't go in a place cold and be like go buy multi-million dollars worth of technology hardware software you build connections you need the same thing within that engineering you need connections you need to connect to the rest of the business not just within engineering but with your support teams with your install teams within your sales teams within your marketing teams so, you know, that's one of those great assets as you come in with soft skills is being able to do that. Um, and that obviously helps the whole company. Yeah, I really like the word that you mentioned here, the whole ality of it. And, you know, women are really good at empathy. They are really good at communication bridge builders. I think that is innate within us. Um, I think that does get overlooked when it comes down to the products and results that need to happen. Um, another client of mine who really developed um, testing in HR, right, for um, really identifying soft skills uh, rather than the hard skills. And I do remember um, him saying that 99% of people are hired for their hard skills, but 99% of people are terminated or leave because of their soft skills. And I thought, you know, that's really very interesting. We don't put enough attention on soft skills. They're really overlooked, right? And women are really good at those particular points. And we know that communication is probably paramount in an organization, right? What do you feel like are men's soft skills that are really valuable 
that women need as counterparts, especially in engineering from your viewpoint? So, you know, it kind of mixes in with the hard skills. Obviously, you can't just mm -hmm. completely separate somebody into soft skills or hard skills. Totally. So as I look at it, they really do have networks out there already. So a lot of networks are built and, you know, sometimes it's easier for the men to get into those networks that exist because they already know somebody. They 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 know people in the different industries because they went to college with them. They, you know, whatever. They have the networks built. They help each other get jobs. That's what we want everybody to be doing. Uh, we love referrals because that, but referrals, of course, um, and if you know you've had other people on the show here that have talked about it, get you to have people that are like you coming mm -hmm. in. So they, with their soft skills, they've built that. They know how to talk to each other and they do have, they, 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 they need the same things to build the bridges to look broadly. So they have some of those similar skills, but they already have a lot of this stuff kind of in place for them because they already know the people they already, you know, it's like, well, how do you see yourself being a VP? Well, you know, my cousin's brother's friend is a VP here. Let me go hook you up and talk to that person. And I think a lot of times for women, it's harder for us to reach out. You know, I love my counterparts at my company who have such boldness. They'll jump at opportunities that, you know, maybe I second guess myself at. And I really try to strive to be more like them of saying the, well, yeah, that's going to be hard. That's going to be challenging. Maybe I don't have the right skill set, but let me try anyway. You know, a lot of the males that I work with, maybe they have some of those same insecurities, but they go after those opportunities just naturally. Society expects them to. Society has raised them to take on those challenges where that's not necessarily how we teach our little girls to behave. We don't teach them in all cases how to challenge, how to go against those hardships. So it's you know, so true. It's that, so true. That, that being bold, that being tenacious, going after something are really soft skills as well that, you know, I admire in my leaders, I admire in my peers and the engineers that work for me, you know, those soft skills also add so much richness to our environment. Yeah, that's so very true. What do you feel like is the biggest risk right now with not enough women applicants for STEM? Well, obviously without enough women applicants, we aren't hiring many and they, you know, they'll get filtered out because, uh, you still got to prove yourself in that interview. And so, you know, getting through the filters to get to that engineering leader to look at your resume, you know, let's just say you're doing everything. You're putting yourself out there when you have a fraction of the skills that the, you know, the posting says you're supposed to have instead of checking all the boxes. Let's just say you're on par. You got a couple, you put it out there. We got to get through that HR screening process. You got to get to the interviews. You have to prove yourself. We don't have a, a lot of applicants. It's harder to get people onto the team that have diversity. I think that's, you know, we won't, you know, my dream is 50 50. I mean, and it is a dream considering if we're at, you know, around 20 to 22%, it's a long way to go. But even getting to that 30 to 40%, we can't get the diversity on our teams if people aren't applying. And if people aren't applying because they don't have the skills in the background because they already self-selected out, then we're never going to, you know, have the thought patterns that we want. We won't increase women in leadership roles. You know, it's interesting because one of our offices does have a woman. Um, she's also a senior manager, but she's the highest person in engineering in that office in Europe. They have higher diversity rate for their hires. They have more women that get hired there. And, you know, part of my my hiring process is around communication skills. It, it is trying to find, you know, I say, Alex, call them the magic unicorn. You have my hard skills and my soft skills. <laughs> and, you know, as we're doing that, she is being very successful at bringing in more diversity because she can see it, she values it. And, People come and, you know, obviously you want to 
when you interview, you you want to like the person you're going to work for. And when you're emphasizing more than just you're going to heads down, you know, you're bringing in different talent. But if we don't have the women that are in those leadership roles, being those role models for our next generations, and then helping to influence how we are hiring, who we are bringing in, we will never be able to increase our diversity, increase our women within this industry. That's true. Just by being in those roles, you automatically assume that hat of role model, whether you want to or not. That is a, that is something that society puts on us, isn't it? Yes. And you you have to grow into that role. There's just no way, it's no way to hide from it, right? Um, so this goes back to, it's a gener, it seems to be a generational problem in the sense that we need to go even earlier at the root cause of how do we get more girls interested in STEM? How do we get more girls graduating uh, and going and not dropping out, right, of the program, Mm -hmm. handling those hardships um, to increase our, you know, talent pool? So, you know, I'm really interested from your perspective, what you think needs to change as far as that status quo? Absolutely. You know, you are a role model as soon as you step into some of this stuff. Naturally, I'm an introvert to thinking like I was going to be a role model. Not exactly what I thought I was going to be in my career, but embrace. um, I embrace that now. It's taken a little bit. But one of the things that I have to say is, you know, you've got different ways to disrupt your industries. You've got different ways to do it. Obviously, I'm trying to be that role model and going down into the schools, and we'll talk about that in a, in a minute here, but you can do global disruption, run a really large companies, new products and whatnot. But for something that I see, you know, in my mindset, if you really want to change something as fundamental as what people want to do for their career, That has to be at a local level. You do that by building connections. You do that by, you know, going into schools. You do that by going to colleges, showing up at the career fairs, being that model. It's hard to do it globally. You can create those programs, but you still need boots on the ground people to do it because that's what kids resonate with. They're not going out to your, you know, nonprofit website and reading about this themselves because they don't know <laughs> about it. Yeah. They're, I was just be honest. They're watching, you know, YouTube video gamers playing their favorite games. They're, right. they're watching Minecraft, whatever stuff. That's what my kids are totally, right? doing. So if you want to truly change this game, you have to do it at a local level. You build those connections. And that honestly starts at grade school. Because by the time females are moving into middle school, they've already selected out of this because their STEM program classes are all male. And you're in a vulnerable, in your middle school, we've been there. You're oh, vulnerable. you're so vulnerable. You're oh my so goodness. vulnerable. And you don't want to be different. You want to blend in. So if you're not blending in and you are the only female in your class, you don't want to be there anymore. It takes a real passionate individual to stand up and be in there to handle the teasing that you're going to get how do we fix that it's to have more people to go into those classes more females and diverse you know students going into there so that you don't have that dynamic okay so by the time they hit that sixth grade level they've already said no so that's where it really comes in you know it's working in your local school districts how do you Mm. partner Um, when I really started evaluating this for myself, I have two boys. I don't have the natural in, you know, I'm not going to Girl Scouts and like making friends (laughs) with other, you know, female moms. It's, it's challenging. So I approached the school district and I said, you know, Hey, I know I don't have a female in this, but what are you doing? How can I help? How can I, I mean, they love fair and volunteers. They love community they love, they, volunteers. They, do. they love that. Yeah. So, you know, I worked with the technology advisor at my son's grade school at the time. And I said, what can I do? Can I come help you on your STEM days in the classrooms? And he was like, you know, I was thinking about setting up an after school program. And I was like, sign me up. I don't even know what you're doing, but sign me up. And that really kicked off a lot of great stuff. We started with an all female program. 
And, you know, I get to see firsthand the challenges of third, fourth, and fifth graders. I'm not an elementary school teacher. So I had to be like right there in it and see like their their emotional state and their mindset. Some of them really gravitated towards it until their friend next to them was like, this is lame or whatnot. And then their mind changed Mm -hmm. like, oh, well, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't have a passion, you know, and it took a lot of work to really get those girls to say, and this was, you know, this was a population of students that, you know, was, is in the lower income brackets. It's a, was a free program for them, which is really cool that our school district does this. But, you know, you could just see that they were going through other hardships. So why are they not picking another thing to do it? Because they're having problems at home. Yeah. That they're having, you know, why would you pick something that's super challenging if just getting food every day is super challenging? So being there and being that encouraging adult really helped some of them continue on. And, you know, as I watched them, um, obviously at the different schools, like, so I saw some of them that were struggling and now they're at the academic achievement award ceremonies that we go to and whatnot and seeing that continued exposure and picking those science classes now within middle school and some of them are now going into the high school programs. So if you show up, if you're there, There are a lot of programs. You can start them up with your school districts or you can look for them in your area. The one of the ones that I really love um, that, you know, was much easier for me to volunteer at before pandemic shut everything down is a program called Technovation. That actually is for females and they uh, middle school and high schoolers, they make their own teams. They pick a problem that they want to solve. They build an app. They do sales pitching. They like have to troubleshoot this thing. And the then there thing. are, there are then local competitions, statewide competitions. And it goes, it's actually a worldwide program. So they can go and get travel, you know, to the awards stuff or the pitches, whatnot. Um, obviously the recent years it became more virtual, but those programs exist. Uh, here in Minnesota, another program that I was looking at uh, for a while and finally got the opportunity, um, our Minnesota colleges are doing outreach programs back into the community, and they always need, you know, business leaders and role models to help with that. They have done mock interviewing. We just recently had um, job shadow students coming into our schools, and this is a female program they the you know rising stars within high school have to apply to be in this they're picking really those top students that are going to excel and you know having programs for them so they can see what is it like to work not all of us have the time i don't have the time because i have a lot of stuff going on i can't create an entire program myself but i can partner with stuff that's there and get the company involved with it That's what I was going to ask you. You know, you do this. Can companies become involved in this? I think they don't know where to go. So, you know, one of the things that I've done at a past company was create um, an employee resource group. A lot of companies have them. And if your company doesn't have one, you can always ask to start up these groups. And maybe it's not enough a formal employee resource group, but you can set up a women's focused group that gives you a chance to network and that allows you to then influence your company's direction and show HR of the different partnerships that are out there. I've done a lot of stuff kind of grassroots on my own. This is my passion project. Mm -hmm. I want my companies to be involved. But as you know, we've been going through different transitions, it wasn't the right time for the company to be all gung ho about it. So I've done some of this stuff on my own. And now, okay, now how do I bring the company into it? What programs are there? And I'll be honest, a little nerve wracking to go to senior directors and, you know, the CEO and say, hey, I want this. You know, it, it's hard. But You can start small. That's what I did with this is, you know, get some of my coworkers, go to a mentoring event with me. Hey, you know, a million women mentors is going to have an event at whatever school that's close to us. Hey, this is what's happening. Who wants to come with? Who wants to do this? Okay, now I know who's interested in this. Now I can build a network within the company. Okay, now I have my network within the company. What other programs can we do? It does take a little bit of research. This isn't a free activity. It's not people just knocking on my door saying, come partner with me. 
And right. I wish they would because that'd be so much easier. But it is that that Google search. What's out there? What's there? Uh, follow, you know, following women's groups on Facebook allows me to see what's happening. And then how do I get it? And then asking the company is saying, hey, this thing's happening. This job shadow thing's happening. Do you care if I set this up? Can they come here? What, you know, challenges do we have? Oh, I need a non-disclosure. Can legal do this for me? And they're not going to say no because they want diversity. They just they don't do. know. They don't know how to do some of this stuff. So if you bring these things to your companies, the chances that they're going to say no are very slim. And if they do say no, you can still go volunteer and do this stuff and be that role model on your own. Um, again, well, maybe no, it's not always no. It just may be it, no for the time being. I and it might not. That. It might be the no. You can't bring them into this because we're a secure facility. Okay. Can we go to them? Like, what is the other? Why are they saying it? Is that it's not the we don't want the diversity or we don't want you to do it. But, you know, why are they saying it for this event? Maybe it's bad timing. Maybe it's because, again, you need security clearance to come in here and we don't want to do that. So how do you work around those things in order to, you know, again, show what's possible partner with the younger kids all the way through high school, partner with the college age students. There are a lot of coding uh, clubs within the colleges. And they, again, want partnership with industry leaders. And by an industry leader, you could be an associate engineer. They look at you as somebody who's there, who can tell them what it's been like, and you can help them increase their skills. I think that's awesome. And it, does require reiteration of this is that companies do want and leadership does want diversity they do want more women applicants they just don't know how to acquire them and where to go get them and sometimes the solution is far into the future they have to look at these long-term survival concepts and say how do we embrace this and get more girls and to bring our employee talent pool up to the point where we can hire more women maybe i won't be at the company at that time but you know this is really where it starts um i've sp spoken to a lot of leadership a lot of men and um they just don't even know what are the things that are important to women right as far as what to offer them or how to attract more women currently have you noticed that yes i mean it's it's hard and we we frame it as like what do women want but a lot of these things our male counterparts want as well flexibility we all want flexibility you know the whole you know nine to five job doesn't exist it's never exists so it's like eight to five job seven to five job you know we end up working a lot of hours within a tech industry. We want flexibility. <laughs> Obviously, we want a 40 hour work week, but that, sometimes that's not realistic. We need that flexibility and go take appointments when we need to take them for ourselves or for our family members or just even for our mental health. You know, right. we want to be able to work from home. Same thing with our male counterparts. When we start getting into obviously things like maternity leave and here in the US, these are controversial topics. The rest Very. of the world, they're not. You know, my my counterparts that are out of Edinburgh, oh look, they're gonna go on maternity leave for a year. You know, they're out for a year, they get paid for it. That's amazing. You know, we're on short-term disability for six weeks if you're lucky. Yeah. Some don't even have that and you're expected to go back to work. But the same thing is like, we talk, it, obviously you have to recover as a woman, but you need bonding time with both parents. So, you know, we can frame them as, you know, obviously I want this stuff, but I want my, you know, future generations to have it. But if we start looking at what do we really want, we want support. We want people to mentor. We want encouragement within the workplace. We want those HR policies that make it so that you can have that work ba life balance because, you know, in this day and age, you've got your phone with you. Are you really ever truly away from work? You have to consciously do that. And if you have leadership that's not expecting you to reply to emails at midnight, is not expecting you to work your weekends, it's a whole lot easier to mute that alarm 
to put the phone down to not worry about the like, oh, well, I have to keep the keep the sound on at night or not, you know, have it never go into do not disturb mode. So a lot of the stuff is leading with empathy, you know, thinking about we're not machines. We we need support. How do you grow? How do we be present within our employees lives? Um, each team member's lives. How do you be there? How do you care about them as a person? And one of the things that I love is having that rapport with my leader where I can come in and be like, okay, I've got this situation at home. I need advice. I know that you've been through something similar. I know that you went down this journey with one of your children. What resources do you have for me? You don't get that overnight, but if you hire in leaders that think about their employees, even if your HR policies can't change, you're going to retain more of your employees, whether they're female or not. And obviously, if we have less turnover, then we can focus on more talent coming in, or you can focus on different programs and you can focus on what you're what you're building because you're not constantly, you know, hiring to backfill and always, you know, underwater, which is, I think, every company right now is the, you know, as everybody's jumping jobs, I know it's calming down a little bit because, you know, some people are doing layoffs now, but it's, it's hard to constantly being, be hiring. You put your resources there when you could be putting all of that time and, you know, effort into something else that's going to have larger payoffs. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that is a very logical, um, wide view of looking at it. Um, And it's really very true that what women want is really what the male counterparts want as well. And that's important. And it cuts out the differentiation. You know, it's like if we look too much at the differences, we don't look at our similarities um, and that makes it for a hostile work environment, even if it's covertly hostile, right? Correct. Did you have a point in your career where it was like an epiphany where you're like, that's it. I've got to do something about it. Or that's it. Like, oh my gosh, I'm a role model. <laughs> like, what, like, did you have that or did it come to you gradually? It's, it's more of a gradual thing, but you know, as I go in and it's my first job, I, I laugh because I always thought I was going to come in and be an individual contributor. I am an introvert. Like I'm like focused on my own thing, but even within my first job, it was just so, well, how do I focus on my own thing when everything else, like there's so many other things that influence it. I'm never a person that was able to just like have this and not see the big picture, which is why I am in leadership now, because like, I like to focus on the big picture, you know? So my first job, uh, I quickly became a senior there um, and working on some of the most complicated problems with our healthcare environment. We were making medical uh, billing software at the time. Everyone who wants their bills correct. Uh, and data flowing from different parts was was a large challenge within that. At that company, we actually had a lot more diversity. So I wasn't really looking at it. I had other females on my team. Uh, But I was seeing like we were having retention problems there. However, I was not in a position to really make changes. I was way too timid at that point to speak up to my leadership. Uh, My second company, I moved out of the healthcare. I wanted to try something different. I became an engineer, worked with Java. But even within there, I kept being like, there's just not systemic problems within what we are doing. We did not have a lot of diversity there. And I didn't know why. It wasn't until after I became a manager there that I really understood. Why are we having diversity problems? because I have no applicants that are diverse. (laughs) I have the option of a 20 something white male. How do I hire something, somebody who's different than that if we don't have anybody applying? And even the recruiting firms weren't bringing us a whole lot of diversity at the time. And that's where I really started looking at like, well, how do I get support? Like what exists out there? That was the first job I started exploring uh, women in technology international. What exists out there for a support system? And I wasn't alone. The problems that I was seeing 
I was still young in my career. I didn't know this was systemic problems. I didn't know that other people were facing the same things. I didn't know that, you know, some of the discriminations that I was facing in the workforce, you know, I was a manager at the time and I got a brand new leader. I was so excited. I was going to have a new leader and he was supposed to be open and all this. And he didn't treat me like a leader there. He was giving me his credit card and asking me to order lunch for his meeting. I was like, well, I'm an engineering manager. I built this software and you think I'm only good enough to do lunch. And that was really that. Well, how do I be different? Obviously, take the experiences that you have and make sure you don't do those to your employees. But then I was like, but if this is how we're being viewed, I'm a female, so this is my role. How do I change that? And that was really the time where I started pushing hard is I want I want women above me. I want to change this because this is not okay. I can do so much more than create a seating chart and order you <laughs> f- food and have you make me feel like crap all the time. You know, leaving yeah. that was a really great thing. So if you're in one of those situations, know there are great companies out there and you do not have to put up with that in your work environment. I hope that that isn't as prevalent now than it was, you know, 15 years ago. I really hope not. Um, but no, if you're in those, if you're in uh, an abusive work environment, that there are great companies out there and there are great companies that have training programs as well. Some companies really do care and the trainings that they put into this stuff, you know, I'll just put a plug out there. I worked at an Aetna company. The Aetna trainings helped me be the leader that I am today. That's amazing. They they really helped build that skill set and they had a focus on building their female leaders. That that helped me understand how I should be doing things, not just how I do things different than my this was previous Aetna? boss. This was at Aetna, yes. Good for so. them. Kudos to Aetna. Yeah. I was, you know, as, as I look at it, there's a lot of things I don't like about the healthcare industry and insurance is one of them. You know, being in America, most people like have good gripes about their insurance companies, but you know, they do care. They do have stuff and they are trying to make leaders for tomorrow. Um, obviously I don't work there anymore, which was my, my choice of needing to move on in my career from that. But I've taken those learnings. It's the taking the learnings and being that leader you want. So as you had said, you know, at what point did I realize I was a role model? You know, it was there. It was through those trainings that I realized that I had stepped into something that people were looking at me. Every behavior that you do, people are watching. You know, it was one of those like, oh, my God, I need five five minutes to make it to the other side of the building and use the bathroom. So you're like walking as fast as you can. Well, what did that tell your employees? So I have no idea why you're doing this. They're like, oh, my God, there's like a fire. There's a sense of urgency. It's like, no, I really have to use the bathroom. <laughs> did I know that they were watching me at the time? No, I didn't. And then when it was brought to my attention, I was like, I really have to be intentional. Like I have to be intentional about what I'm doing because I influence more than just myself. And that was really looking at as like how I present myself is how people think things are happening. And then outside, outside of, you know, my day job, how I present myself also reflects upon the companies that I work for. If I go out and I'm grumbling about a situation and somebody overhears it, they're not going to want to go apply or look at your company. And they're like, oh, people there aren't happy, even though it was one bad day. So it's really, you know, being mindful, being conscious. It is totally okay to go vent to your friends. It's not what I'm <laughs> saying. But, you know, being mindful of who you are and what you want people to see. Don't be fake. Don't be inauthentic. You can have good days. You can have bad days. But no that you are a role model. People are looking at you. And in my situation, you know, they, you know, I have have kids. And while I say they're boys, the parents and the children in their classrooms and in the schools that I go visit, I am that role model. They are looking at it. And if I come in there and I am grumpy, if I come in there and I clearly don't like what I do, why would they want to go into that career? Why would they want, you know, it's the same thing. Well, it just even at that micro level, you're a parent. 
your kids are going to pick their career and what you say at home matters. If you're always complaining about your, your boss, why would that child ever want to go into a leadership role? They hear it as a negative thing. So, you know, keeping that in the back of your mind, it's gradual how I got to this place, but there are definite points in time where, you know, really stand out to me. Yeah. Everything you've been saying reminds me of the, you know, the the moral code precept of setting a good example. And you think about that old time movie, you know, It's a Wonderful Life and all the little micro events that he had an effect on others and what would happen if he wasn't there. It's a really good point. I never expected to get so philosophical on this, but it really does boil down to that, doesn't it? It does. So what do you do outside of Canon? By the way, Canon is very lucky to have you, I think. They're very fortunate to have you. But what do you do? Do you have any crazy passions? I do have a lot of passions. Um, so we're, we're, we'll just probably hit on a couple of them. But the two biggest things that I do right now outside of work, I sit at a computer and I talk to people all day. Um, so in my spare time, um, I do rock climbing and I do taekwondo. And rock climbing turned from a passion into my second job, uh, <laughs> which is always great, right? I mean, I, it's it's scary, though, when you yeah. take your passion and turn it into a job. And no, I'm not a professional rock climber. I'm way too old to compete with those 18-year-olds. Like, the, they can do is just phenomenal. Uh, but right before the pandemic hit, my husband and I had an opportunity to buy a rock climbing hold company called Method Grips. And for anybody who doesn't know what that is, like, what is a hold company? So you go to your indoor rock climbing facility, um, lots of them across the country. Most people have been there, even if it's for the kid's birthday party. The holds on the wall that you're climbing, so the wall is kind of blank and you've got colorful climbing holds all over it. Those are removable. There are route setters that actually set those. We sell the actual holds. My husband does a lot of the design. Um, we also buy it from other freelancers. And then um, we have a manufacturer. We do drop shipping. Uh, we have a manufacturer in Colorado that makes them. And then we drop ship from them to the uh, home wall customers and then the large gym facilities. I had no idea. I had <laughs> I had no idea that there was all of this that went into that, right? And these rock climbing gems or boutique gems. What's the name of the company that you have? So the name is called Method Grips. You can check us out at methodgrips.com. I laugh at all this though, because as I talk about like, oh, being a woman in a STEM. Okay, so my side job I picked up and I'm one of the you know, I, I know of one other female whole, whole company, like, like, oh, look, I stepped from being like, oh, let's be in a STEM industry to rock climbing, which is a male dominated industry as well. I was like, I can't give myself a break. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, I think it's just what you were meant to be. And maybe we go back to when you were two years old and you probably <laughs> said, I'm going to do blah. <laughs> and then you forget about it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I don't, my, my parents aren't very happy about the, when I started the whole rock climbing thing. Uh, cause I didn't start until I was in college because my parents like rock climbing is dangerous. Rock climbing is dangerous. You can get hurt rock climbing. Absolutely. And I was like, you're what? Isn't that dangerous? And now, you know, they're like, oh, wow, you've made like an actual job out of this. Yeah, business uh, out of it. Yeah, yeah. I have a business out of it. So it, it's really cool. Well, they should have known that you were like, you know, a, a pioneer and different from the pack <laughs> when you went into STEM, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Janelle, how do people get a hold of you? How do uh, other women leaders get a hold of you, male leaders, um, you know, to talk about this, you know, what they can do to help with diversity and the programs? How do they get a hold of you? So the first and most easiest way to get a hold of me so your email doesn't get lost is actually via LinkedIn. I am active out there. So um, look me up, Janelle Nelson, on the LinkedIn platform. I respond, you know, send me a personal message out there. I will get back to you within a couple of days. If you are currently looking for a job and you are interested, uh, you can shoot me uh, an email to my Canon email address, which is Janelle dot nelson at mi 
.medical .canon. It's a mouthful. <laughs> if you want to have a more personal, uh, my personal email that you can get a hold of me is at jnel03 at gmail.com. Awesome. I'm so glad you put a plug in for a job too. And I will say, I'm glad I met you on LinkedIn. Yes. I am glad you reached out because you have a really cool show and everybody like should go watch all of the episodes. They're so inspiring. And again, industries I didn't know existed out there and are being disrupted. Right? I know. I get inspired every time. I'm always like amazed when I, I learn so much on these. I've learned a lot on this, a lot. Thank you very much. I, as I've been, you know, interviewing you, I've been thinking like, okay, I'm going to send this show to this person, this person, this person. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. That's a wrap, everyone. If you learned something today, tell someone about this podcast and tell people to go disrupt their markets with a tidbit from the show. Thank you for listening to Disruption Interruption, where we transform lives change consumer behavior, alter economics, and never accept the status quo. Ciao for now. Because we live in a highly litigious society with America being one of the top litigious countries in the world, here's our legal disclaimer. This information is not intended to be a substitute for professional public relations or legal advice. Do not disregard seeking professional legal, healthcare, or financial advice or delay seeking professional PR or legal advice because of something you have heard here. Contact an attorney to obtain advice on any particular legal situation or problem. Use of this podcast or our website or any of its social media or email links do not create an agency-client relationship between Joto PR and the user.